The Prepper Podcast, episode 53. You've got to know whether or not their president is the American people would never vote for socialism. And he said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adapt every fragment of the socialist program. Podcast is an up to date survival podcast based on military wilderness and modern day survival and may be found at theprepperpodcast.com. I am Ken Jensen and this is the podcast about everything survival. My goal is to teach you strategies on self reliance and to develop survival skills and critical thinking in everyone, resulting in a more resilient yet a more enjoyable life. This is episode 53, and today is going to be another great episode. I'm answering all of your questions for the second week in a row, everything from batteries to vehicles. I also have a new segment and a product review for you today. So stick around and get ready to listen to The Prepper Podcast. The show notes for today may be found at theprepperpodcast.com forward slash zero five three. That's theprepperpodcast.com forward slash zero five three. Now for the housekeeping. This is week two, like I said, of me answering all of your questions. If you would like to contact me and to leave feedback for the show, the best method to call or the best method to contact me for feedback would be nine seven eight knows it. That is also nine seven eight five six six nine seven four eight. Remember that number, save it in your phone. If you have feedback on the fly, just go ahead, give me a call, and I am going to start trying to answer a feedback question every now and then during my normal episodes as well. But this isn't a normal episode. This is a feedback episode. You can also contact me if you go to theprepperpodcast.com and you click on the green banner on the right hand of my webpage. All right, there's a green banner on the right, and when you click that, it will allow you to record off of your computer. So if you have a microphone and most laptops have one built in, you can leave feedback. Remember, if you're calling me on a cell phone, you must have two bars or greater and you must have very little background noise. Not zero background noise, but try to make it halfway decent because when I amplify your voice, I'm going to amplify your sound as well because a lot of people start to fade off as they're talking, so I have to deal with that. You can also contact me. You can do the written thing. If you just cannot call, which I prefer you to call or click the green banner, but if you cannot do either one of those for some reason, you can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, or Google+. Just go to theprepperpodcast.com forward slash Facebook, Twitter, or Google+. You can also email me, ken at theprepperpodcast.com, and you could leave comments in today's show notes. Now, Jay Bradbury is back, everyone. That's right. Jay Bradbury of preparepdx.com. He is back, and he has a great new segment for us. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm really enjoying the fact that he's back, and uh, I'm almost giddy. So let's go to the news segment with Jay Bradbury of preparepdx.com. Thanks, Ken. And now for your news flash. Genetic factors behind surviving or dying from Ebola shown in mouse study. A newly developed mouse model suggests that genetic factors are behind the mild to deadly range of responses to the Ebola virus. Moving on, rapid geomagnetic reversal possibility is confirmed. Suspicious observers lays down a very compelling case why our poles may reverse in the next 100 years. Last but not least, two 
lost elk hunters rescued at southeast of Primeville, Oregon. Two hunters from Springfield tracking an elk couldn't find their way back to their pickup Sunday evening and weren't prepared to spend the night in the woods east of Primeville, so they called for help and were found cold, wet, but otherwise okay. We want to make sure that you are prepared when you're out, when you're out hunting. All right, back to you, Ken. Thank you, Jay, for that wonderful news segment. So let's uh, let's give you my take on some of this stuff. First off, genetic factors behind Ebola. We we all know that. I mean, everybody is genetically different, and there are going to be factors in your genetics that make you react differently to. Uh, any type of of disease or anything like that. Okay, so Ebola is no different. Here's the thing: you get hemorrhagic or the hemorrhagic fever. You get that because your body essentially ends up kind of attacking itself. Because when you get this, it causes you to start getting more um, more death of blood cells and things like that. Okay. So you're basically getting the deadly stuff because there's something in your DNA that says to do this. Well, there are some other genetics that predisposition someone to try to fight it. They try to fight this strain and those are the people that live. So basically, if your body fights this strain, then your body will I mean, you'll, you'll survive because Ebola is actually a very weak virus. It's just very smart and it's got a certain way of making your body do things. So if your body fights it, you'll live. If your body doesn't fight it correctly because it's a smart virus or it's a smart thing and, and you guys will, you know, your bodies will react incorrectly. If that's the case, then it can kill you. But here's the thing. It kills quickly. So it can't become a pandemic or an outbreak that everybody in the prepper community is looking for. So don't worry so much about that. Just build up your resilience on that. And that's all I'm going to say about the Ebola strain. Um, just understand that there are some factors. There are people looking into it. But there are other things that you could be worrying about right now than this specific strain of something. Okay, just build your resiliency. If for some reason a flu happens that really does cause a pandemic, then you can you can go into quarantine and be okay. You need a, quite a bit of food. You need quite a bit of water and things of that nature in order to survive a quarantine. Because part of the reason why quarantine succeeds is because the people that are under quarantine die. So if you want to live in quarantine so that you don't go out and get sick, well then have your preparations. That's it. That's enough of this. The rapid geomagnetic reversal. We all know that this is a possibility. There's nothing that we can do with this except for build our resiliency. Okay. One thing this does tell you is to pay attention to all updated maps. Because if you go to cleversurvivalist.com and, um, you, I, I, I have a blog and I, you can go to theprepperpodcast.com forward slash YouTube and I have a YouTube channel where I have a video that shows you how to use a compass and map. Well, here's the thing. If you're using an outdated map, that means that you could be several percent off and several percent can take you miles and miles from your destination. So make sure you're using updated maps at all times and uh, let's just uh, hope that the transition for this uh, reversal will be a calm one. But let's prepare to stay home and let's prepare to do whatever we have to do to survive. But this is one of those things that you can't really you can't really stop, right? You cannot stop this. So don't worry about it. Just prepare for it. Now, the two lost elk hunters. The two lost elk hunters, um, if you're out hunting elk, I'm sorry, you need to have a certain amount of con you know, certain amount of content. Now I don't think that if you're elk hunting, because you have to understand when you're hunting, you can't carry all this survival gear with you. Everybody in the comments of this story was talking about all this survival gear 
Well, there is a certain basic amount of survival gear that you need to keep on you at all times when trekking into the wilderness. But you can't carry an entire bug out bag or something like that with you when you're going hunting because there's there's plenty of other things that you have to worry about while you're out there. And if you have never hunted, then you probably don't know. But if any of you have hunted, you understand what I'm talking about. And normally if you go hunting... Uh, a normal person would probably pre-scout the area and know where they're at and know how to get back. And uh, which this brings me to my next point. These people could not get back to their vehicle. Okay, so they drove their vehicle there. They went in however deep and then they started tracking this elk. My guess is one of them got a shot. They tracked the elk. They weren't paying attention to where they were going. Well, there's an issue here, right? They weren't leaving markers for themselves to get back where they came from as they were tracking this thing. All right, there are markers that you could be using. You could be using zip ties. You could be using the um, the ribbon and stuff like that to mark trees so that you can come back. There are some awesome reusable zip ties and stuff like that. And I love taking pieces of aluminum foil and using colored reusable zip ties with a big... A piece of aluminum foil underneath that zip tie so that as you're coming back with a let's say it's dark if it's dark you're not really going to see the bright colored zip tie but as you're using your flashlight or your headlamp to get around then you're probably going to see a flash from the aluminum foil just remember this take the multi cut the really bright colored zip ties the reusable zip ties and use them around trees and use aluminum foil or something like that to zip tie to the tree. So now you're not damaging the tree really. You're just zip tying to something to it that you'll take away later. And I would use this as an entire perimeter as well around where like your deer stand or something like that is. So that would have helped these guys get back. Now, here's one thing. They called for help and help came. So there's something to be said for the fact that they were in the middle of the woods and they had cell phone reception. They used a cell phone to call. That's why you people that shun cell phones 100% just shun them and say they don't have a place out in the woods and all this other stuff. These people, a cell phone saved them, okay? They could have died from hypothermia if they had not had a cell phone. And this cell phone had reception. Now, even if they couldn't have called 911, because that's what they did. They called 911, and they used the GPS coordinates from the 911 call to find these guys. And they were cold and everything else, but they were fine. Now, here's the thing. If you don't have a signal, if you don't have a signal, you, a lot of times, can still get a message through. Now, I should say, if you don't have enough of a signal to call, a lot of times you can still get a message through. I just recently upgraded my phone, and it has this really awesome feature, and I bet you that some of you guys are going to be able to tell me what it, what kind it is, um, but I, I, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you now. Uh, Galaxy S5. The Galaxy S5 has a mode that will, uh, it will automatically put it in basically long-term storage mode, essentially. It will reduce all the functionality of this phone. And the phone will last for, I don't remember exactly how long, but let's say a couple weeks. And once it gets down to a certain point, once this phone gets down to a certain point, as long as you have it enabled, this phone on its deathbed, when the battery is on its deathbed, the phone will blast out one final GPS coordinate, and then it'll die. So if you're anywhere near a tower or anything like that, and this phone can blast out that GPS coordinate, you could have just saved your life even when the battery just died. So phones are getting much, much smarter to the limitations of what's happening, okay? They're getting a lot smarter to the limitations of the cell phone reception and the towers and everything else. So upgrading phones can be a privacy issue, but it can also be very useful. And I'm going to tell you, This is also modern-day survival, right? Military wilderness and modern-day survival. Well, 
in wilderness survival and modern day survival, you put the two together and a cell phone just saved someone's life. Just saved two guys' lives. So for those of you who say that cell phones have no place, well, it just saved some guys' lives. Now, I do not feel that you should rely on a cell phone being available, okay? It's just the way, it's the exact same way that I look at fires. You utilize the tools and you try to bring the tools that make it easy, but you can't rely on them to always work. You have to have more primitive skills that allow you to, you know, that allow you to create the fire or have communications or find your way back home. You have to be able to do this without the modern technology. But use the technology as a convenience if it's available. That's what it's there for. So like I told you guys, when I have products to review, I will review them on the podcast. So here is today's product review. The product is the Rodent Survival Tactical Military Belt CQB Rigger. Um, they, They did the product name really, really bad. It's basically, it's a CQB Rigger survival tactical military belt by a company named Rodent. Okay. Um, as I was reading the name of this belt, it's just loaded down with SEO keywords and stuff like that. So I'm just ignoring all that I said right there. Just remember it's the Rodent survival military tactical belt. Okay. And then that will come up. You could also go to the show notes for today's episode, theprepperpodcast.com forward slash 053. And if you go there, you will see the review and you'll see a link that will take you to the belt. All right, so let's get started with the review. The first thing that I want to do is tell you what Amazon says about this belt, um, what they said on Amazon about this belt. So it's highly durable and versatile tactical CQB rigger belt, um, suitable for law enforcement and military use, durable metal buckle and hook, adjustable size, sturdily constructed and built to last, offers an incredible 7,000 pound tensile strength. All that means, guys, is if you hold it on one end and you... Pull it on the other end. You can pull with 7,000 pounds of strength on this belt and it will not rip. The fabric of this belt will withstand 7,000 pounds pulling it end to end. It features parachute grade buckles and adapters. Colors are black, OD green, and desert sand brown. All right, I didn't really like the desert sand brown or the OD green, so I went with the black belt. All right, I read good and bad reviews of this belt and decided that it was worth trying because it was only like 20 bucks or so. And I mean, at that, I wasn't really losing a whole lot and I could get a rigger's belt and everything else. So I did, I tried it. And it didn't, at first, it didn't really seem that thick. When When I picked it up and messed with it, it didn't really seem thick. But I looked at the photos, uh, even after I grabbed it, I looked back at the photos, and the photos show you exactly what it is. The photos really don't deny anything about this belt. They, they're they not flashy to make it look any different. I mean, this belt is what it is. If you really look close at the pictures, you can see every part of this belt that makes it unique and everything that makes it worth purchasing, okay? So if you go to the Amazon link, you'll be able to look at a bunch of pictures of this belt and just understand that it's it's not a super thick law enforcement belt. It's meant to be small and it's meant to stay out of your way. It was exactly like the photos, all right? I was wanting a good tactical belt for a holster as well. So the one and a half inch nylon webbing that's on this belt, it did the job well. Okay, if you have a crappy holster that's huge and top heavy, well, number one, you need to get a new holster because how are you going to conceal carry with that thing? How are you going to uh, be tactical at all with that crappy holster? That holster is more important than your tactical belt. So you first need to go and get yourself a new holster. Next, if you have that crappy holster, then you're probably going to have to snug this belt up quite a bit to make it hold the holster up. But you have to understand that that's because the holster will have give. Like a nylon holster or whatever, that will have give instead of your belt. Your belt can't hold something. Like, try to hold a spaghetti noodle with your belt. 
it's not going to do it. The noodle's still going to flop all over the place. So that's not the belt's fault, and that was one of the biggest complaints. Well, get a better holster, and the belt will do its job. The belt did its job for me, okay? I put it on. It seemed to retain the position pretty well. All right, if you have pants with an adjustable band, then it's a great belt to make it cuff to make a comfortable firm fit the uh the rigger the cqb rigger or whatever it's just a metal triangular piece that you can tie or hook to a carabiner or you can tie um paracord and stuff like that to it for all kinds of rigging tasks it has uh the velcro or or the if you put this on there is a there is a metal buckle the metal buckle is really just um, you're basically going to loop the belt through the metal buckle and then the belt holds itself on with Velcro, okay? And it's a lot of Velcro. If I had, uh, that, I think the Velcro over time would probably give up a little bit, so that may be a downfall, but right now the belt's working fine. If I had a complaint, it would probably be the width of the metal buckle in front. All right, when you sit down, if you've got any belly whatsoever, I'm not, I don't have a large stomach, but when I sit down, if I don't have it adjusted correctly, then the metal belt sticks right into my belly and it can be kind of uncomfortable. So it's a little bit wide, but it's much better than other buckled belts. I'm going to tell you that It, it is a lot better, but there are some tactical belts that are more comfortable than this. So remember, they made this for rigging and stuff as well. So if you have this belt, you're going to be able to do other things than just snap the tactical belt on, okay? Another thing, this belt can be used as a tourniquet. I tried it out, and yes, it can be used as a tourniquet. That is a very big benefit of this belt. So if you need a tourniquet fast and quick because you got shot in the arm or leg or something like that, you can use this belt as a tourniquet. But I would recommend that you have a um, a gun a gun carrier's trauma kit. Uh, so I can plug myself now. The gun carrier's trauma kit. I actually have uh, where you can I, if you go to theprepperpodcast.com forward slash trauma kit. I think that will take you to my shop where you can purchase the Gun Carrier's Trauma Kit um, training series. So if you had the funds and you were looking to try something new, what would I say about this belt? I would say get it, try it. It's a pretty good belt for the cost. Now let's get into today's topic, your questions. All right, the first question today is a question sent from Sean from Massachusetts. You may uh, recognize Sean from the last episode. He was the last question, and he actually had a second question that I was hoping to get to last week, but I did not get to it because I ran out of time. So, Sean, go ahead with your question. Hi, Ken. Sean from Massachusetts. I had a second question. What would be your ideal bug-out vehicle? Gas, diesel, standard, automatic, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. I live in Massachusetts. I personally think a gas four-wheel drive standard vehicle would be the best because I don't want to deal with a diesel vehicle up here in the cold weather because they don't like to start all the time, and gas is so readily available around here, and also a four-wheel drive because we get snow and everything else. That's what I would think, but I'd like to know what your opinion is. Thank you. All right, Sean, so you want to know my ideal bug-out vehicle, whether I prefer gas, diesel, standard automatic, two-wheel, four-wheel. You are thinking gas, standard, four-wheel drive. Diesel is hard to crank in the north, and a four-wheel drive, uh, the reason why you want four-wheel drive is for the snow. So let me know if I got that right. Well, here is my answer. My answer is it depends. All right, it is an it depends type of answer, but let me kind of go through all of the different choices that you provided me with all right the first choice in a bug out vehicle is going to be the vehicle that you currently have that's right the vehicle that you currently have i have done a podcast on bug out vehicles and what should be in them 
So go back and check out my podcast on bug out vehicles and uh, what should be in them. There is no excuses for you not to use the vehicle that you have right now as your bug out vehicle. Now, if you're looking to purchase a vehicle, that's a little different, okay? If I had the money to go ahead and purchase an automobile for my bug out vehicle, I would probably personally go with a Jeep Wrangler Unlimited as I have a family. I would go with a regular Jeep Wrangler if I didn't have a family because it has better angles on it. And anybody who's off-roading type of person would understand what the approach and departure angles are and everything else. I'm not going to get into that. Just understand that Jeeps have very good angles on them for off-roading and stuff like that. They give a lot of performance for the money, okay? Hummers and Xterras are fun. As a matter of fact, I believe that Hummers can probably do things off-road that a Jeep can't. Xterras are also really good on uh, uh, off-road at times, and I think the FJ Cruiser has also been proven to be a really good vehicle off-road. But here's the thing. They cost a lot of money, all right? These vehicles cost a lot of money, so you're getting a performance for a high cost. Some of the best off-road vehicles that I have ever driven or had were old Jeeps. Cheap old Jeeps. Just a few thousand bucks. Uh, something that you can fix up a little bit. You're not worried about uh, breaking it down because you trashed it or something like that. Old Jeeps are some of the best off-road vehicles. Now, notice I didn't say bug-out vehicles. These old Jeeps are some of the best off-road vehicles. But another thing about Jeeps is they are highly customizable, as well as uh, they're a very basic design. I mean, I've seen people build a uh, wooden wooden cabinetry and stuff that fits right in the right in the Jeep, and it's bolted down to the Jeep. I've seen people do things with conduit and Unistrut and all kinds of crazy stuff on a Jeep. And the simple design of a Jeep, the no frills, no like curvy plastic crap in the Jeep, that kind of stuff. The fact that you can pull the carpeting out, all it is is like snapped in and stuff like that. You can pull the interiors out a lot easier. I mean, most of the Jeeps are made, especially the old ones, they are made for that kind of stuff. So you can do a lot of stuff so that you can change the design of your Jeep. You can turn that into an ultimate bug out vehicle. You can change it into your ultimate bug out vehicle because you can mount things to it and you can take stuff away and you can put a high rise snorkel on it and you can do all kinds of things that'll allow this thing to go several feet into the water. Okay, so a Jeep is a very good vehicle for off road. I would almost always go with a four wheel drive vehicle as well. All right, I know that you said you were leaning toward four-wheel drive for the snow. Well, I'm going to tell you that that's a good choice. I would always go with the four-wheel drive vehicle, all right? But um, I would probably not get the super mutters and stuff like that. I just had a, a recent argument with somebody at work about the why you would choose a four-wheel drive vehicle over a two-wheel drive vehicle in this area. We don't get a lot of snow here. We mostly just get really thick sheets of ice. And as anybody knows, four-wheel drives don't help you a ton on ice. Well, it does. It helps you go faster, just like in the snow. Here's the thing. Four-wheel drive will help you if you maintain a slower speed. All right, if you're used to going 30 down a road, or let's just use the highway, you're used to going 60, 65 down the highway, and then it snows. Well, in a normal vehicle, you would reduce your speed down to about 25 or 30, wouldn't you? Because you'd be all over the place. Well, in a four-wheel drive vehicle, you should be going the same speed. You should not be going 55 or 60, all right? So that's why people say four-wheel drives don't help. Because you think in a four-wheel drive, because you're not slipping all over the place, that you can go faster. And all that accomplishes is the fact that you can go faster before you go off the road into a ditch and tip over. Which means that there's going to be more damage to the vehicle and more damage to your skull. Now that I'm off of that little rant, make sure that you get a four-wheel drive vehicle if you're going to purchase something. I would also get a nice set 
of 60,000 mile all-terrain tires. All right, ones that I had on one of my old Jeeps that I absolutely loved were the BF Goodrich TA all-terrain tires. They lasted me over 60,000 miles. They had an aggressive grip for an all-terrain tire, and they did very well off-road. They're not mudding tires. I don't believe in having mudding tires on your bug-out vehicle. You're not going mudding if you're bugging out. It is true that you may have to get into a position where you're going through the mud, but the fact is, is if you have mudding tires, you're probably not going to be bugging out on the road very well. So, get all-terrain tires, and those are the ones that I have used in the past that I really enjoy. Now, there are other knockoffs now that have the exact same tread pattern, but I don't know that they're going to be exactly the same. You would be surprised at how much money goes into the research for a set of tires. Okay, so there's a lot of research behind this tread pattern, and the sidewalls look fairly aggressive and stuff like that on these tires, so they're a really nice looking tire too. So if you're one of those guys that like to keep your vehicle nice, well then these tires are going to make it look, look pretty nice, even without jacking anything up, without putting lift kits or spacer lifts or anything like that in your vehicle, you're actually going to do, you're, you're going to make your, um, you are going to make your vehicle look pretty nice. All right, and these tires usually will not require you to get a lift kit for them to fit underneath your uh, fender wells, okay? So, all-terrain tires, four-wheel drive vehicles. I would normally go with diesel, okay? Because generally, they've lasted longer in the past, all right? That's just something that I've got. Diesels usually last longer. New diesels uh, usually have heaters in them, okay? All right, so... Like I said, diesels normally last longer. That may not be the case anymore. Gas engines have come a long way. But the fact is, is my, my experience has been diesels outlast gas engines by a couple hundred thousand miles. Okay, so diesel used to be cheaper, but it's not really so much cheaper anymore, is it? Because now it requires a lot more refining to, or it requires a much larger refining process before you can use them. But in the vehicles that take diesel, a lot of times you don't have to use the refined diesel in a bug out situation. You could use the dirtier diesel, the, the, what they call, um, farmer's diesel nowadays is cleaner than automobile diesel back in the 60s or whatever okay the diesel is a lot cleaner now so you could use farming diesel although it's illegal to use it during normal circumstances you could use that diesel for your vehicle in a bug out scenario you could also create your own diesel like biodiesel but gas engines also have the ability to be converted over to natural gas now you're not creating your own natural gas but you could create your own biodiesel Diesels have issues cranking when they're cold. That's the nature of the beast. Yes, they do. They have issues cranking when it's in the cold. But most of them now have heating elements in them that will keep the block warm and that will help you crank the engine whenever it's cold out. Yes, it requires energy, but if you have these things plugged in uh, into your backup power for a little bit of time or whatever, then you're probably going to be able to get it to crank fairly well. At this point, I wouldn't fault anyone that's going to go with gas or diesel because there are benefits and drawbacks to both. If you're in the cold and you've got experience with diesel up there, um, then I guess, you know, in Massachusetts, you may have a lot of issues with the diesel around there. You just may. And if that's been your experience, then I would not fault you for going gasoline over diesel. I just myself prefer diesel and the length that an engine will last on diesel. So now back to the purchase of a bug out vehicle, the purchase of one. Another decent purchase if you're looking for something as a bug out vehicle, and this is going to be, this isn't just like an automobile or anything like that, but is an RV, a recreational vehicle. Yes, I understand that it's not just a typical vehicle. I understand for all you people that are going to say it could get trapped on the road and stuff like that, and then you're out of luck. Well, 
you know what? There are a lot of vehicles that you could say that about. But the fact is, is an RV is a mobile house. So your bug out vehicle would be your bug out location. And everybody knows that there's something to be said for that. Okay. Don't expect if you get an RV, don't expect to get to crazy remote locations with this thing. I mean, it'll get you out in the boonies a little bit, but you're not going to go 12 miles down the gravel road and then go up the 30 degree incline of the mountain and in three foot of snow. You're not going to do that in this RV. And then you've got, you know, if if you're in an RV, you need to understand that you're going to need some hookups. RVs work fine for like a weekend or something, but eventually you're going to have to hook up to services so that you can utilize it. And if you already have services hooked up on your bug out location, then this will, this will not be much of a problem for you. But RVs can also be cramped. If you're living together with a large family, it's going to suck if you're in an RV. They could be really cramped. So, uh, you know, even that being said, I had fam. believe it or not, I've had family that have lived in RVs and they seemed pretty darn happy. They lived on the lake in an RV. They hardly had any rent and they were basically lake bums and they just lived in their RV. And you know what? They were extremely happy with how they were living life. But there were only two of them. They didn't have a big old family like I have. Okay, so RVs are going to be a little bit cramped for my family. But RVs are still a very good choice. They can hold a lot more stuff. They can hold a lot more people. And they can sustain you as an emergency shelter for a much longer time than a vehicle or any of the gear that you're going to carry with you. The best part of an RV is the fact that it's going to make a very enjoyable camping trip, okay? You're not buying an RV just for your bug out vehicle because if you're doing so, you're wasting your money. You should have just used whatever vehicle you have. If you want an RV for your camping trips and then double up as a bug out vehicle, that's where you're golden, okay? Now, once again, this is going to be up to the buyer, but an RV is going to make your camping trips very nice. If, you know, sometimes if you're out with the family, you're not going to want to rough it. Sometimes I'll go camping with my family and believe it or not, we've got some outrageous things happening. I mean, I I bring my bat I bring a portable battery bank with us. Now this is if I'm going with my family, not by myself and not with uh, other friends, you know, survive in the survival community. But if I'm going with my family, a lot of times we bring the backup battery bank. I throw the battery bank right there beside the tent. I run a cable in to my inverter and I have an inverter right there in my tent and hooked up to the inverter, electric blankets. That's right. We use electric blankets while camping. And man, it is awesome. It's very awesome. So you guys should try that sometime. It will turn a a really cold night, really toasty warm quickly. All right. It's easier. It's it's easier to just get up and go when you want to go camping in an RV though. I mean, if you have all your stuff in there and you know the items typically that you're going to go camping with, you're going to make a list or something like that. If you know those items that you want to go camping with, then you put those in the RV real quick and you can go for a weekend camp trip. You know, it's not that big a deal if you, um, it's not really that big a deal if you just on Friday say, hey guys, let's go camping and you go camping at one of the local campgrounds. Okay, but if you are going tent camping, it's a little bit harder to do that. Yes, you can, but there's a lot more gear and equipment you might need to load up in the vehicle and stuff like that and then go there and then set up the tent. By the time you have the tent set up on a Friday after work, right? By the time you have the tent set up, then it's going to be dark and you've got to basically, you got to either have a fire going when you first get there so that you can cook or... Don't eat that night or go out to eat. It's up to you. And then you've got all the next day, and that's nice and fine. And then halfway through the third day, you've got to start packing everything up and break down your tents and roll up your sleeping bags and all that. In an RV, you drive up, you hook up, you're camping. Then uh, when you're done camping, you unhook. You drive away, or you unhook, you throw a bunch of water on the fire pit, and you drive away. You're done camping. So RVs have their own place 
in the show notes, that's theprepperpodcast.com forward slash 053, you can find links with this question. I have links to a lot of the bug out vehicle uh, posts and podcasts that I've done in case you were wanting further answers on that. The next question is Nick from New York, and he also has a question about the best survival vehicle uh, for surviving, for bug out, and for getting to family. And uh, he also wants to know what you should have in the vehicle. Well, Nick, I've already answered the previous question uh, about what types of vehicles. So I'm not going to cover that so much, but I will give you an answer to what to have in it. So without further ado, here is Nick from New York. Hey, Ken, how's it going? This is Nick from New York. And I just have a few questions about bug out vehicles and... What do you think the best vehicle is to get around, you know, in a survival situation or an urban apocalypse or, you know what I mean? Something to help you survive a certain amount of time without having to actually bug in. So it would be more of a, you know, a good bug out vehicle to survive and, you know, to get to your location, your safe zone, to get to your family or friends. What do you think is a good vehicle as well as what do you think should happen in the vehicle? Thank you very much. Okay, Nick. Like I already said, I already gave my answer for the bug out vehicle question, so I'm going to focus on the contents. The first thing that I think that you should do, period, all right, before even dealing with any of that, any of the vehicle stuff, you need to have a plan. And each pl- and your plan, your bug out plan, your emergency plan, your disaster plan, whatever you want to call it, it has to have three destinations. Okay, three destinations, and each one has to be in a different direction. So one north, one south, one west, whatever. All right, three destinations, each in a different direction. For those three destinations, each one must have three routes to get to the destination. And of those three routes, you know, because you could get stuck on one route and have to go to a different route. So there you've got that. And of those three routes, you need to have three rest stops. So if you get separated from someone, you guys know each of the rest stops that you're going to meet up with the group so that you can all kind of stay together. Okay, so three destinations and each in a different direction, three routes. So three destinations, three directions, three routes, and three rest stops on each route. And let's stick with threes. Keep water, two to three liters per person in your vehicle. Okay? All right, so as you noticed, I've gotten into what you put in your vehicle. This is going to be a quick list because uh, in the previous question, in the show notes, I already have a link to a post and to a podcast that I have done that will have more information on these items. Okay, but keep water, two to three liters per person. Keep a minimum of 72 hours of food in the vehicle. Now, whether it's dried or canned or whatever. Key vehicle items such as fuses, belts, hoses, clamps, antifreeze, jumper cables, tool kits, tow straps, and there are other thing there might be a few more things. These vehicle items are very important because you need your vehicle to stay functional. You're in a bug out scenario because this is your bug out vehicle. You need to keep these items in your vehicle because you need on the fly to be able to fix some small issue, a leak in a hose, or you know, a, a busted hose or a broken belt or something like that. You need to be able to do this. What if you get a hole in your radiator and you need to fill it with water and antifreeze? All right, you need the stuff in your vehicle and this will keep you on the road going toward your destination even in a bad scenario or even in a bad situation with your vehicle. Keep navigational items like maps with marked routes, a compass, and a GPS. The GPS, you know, your phone works really well as a GPS. If you don't have a tower anywhere nearby, then it's not going to work well as a GPS because most of the maps update using cell phone towers, except for some phones now have offline capabilities. Now that's nice. I like to be able to download the map and have offline functionality when it comes to the phone. However, not all phones have that. And get a regular GPS, and I would say get a trail GPS and a road GPS, and the vehicle GPS will work when the cell phone will not. 
sometimes your gps will not work because you cannot see a satellite because you're going around a mountain or something like that well guess what maps with the routes marked the maps with the routes marked you can find where you're at you'll know where you're at and you can determine each place that you need to turn and stuff like that you need to know your route on paper because like i said in the very beginning of this show it's important for you to utilize the comfort items utilize technology but do not rely on them so i utilize these things i use my phone for gps all the time and it's very convenient but you know what i need to have a map in my vehicle because what if it all goes away am i going to be able to get back all right keep basic utility items like lanterns lights shovels a winch a cb or ham radio for communications you know you know why the winch i could have talked about this whenever i was talking about the bug out vehicle uh when i was talking about what type of bug out vehicle to get i would say that every bug out vehicle should have the ability you know should have a mount with a winch on it because you never know especially if you've got those all-terrain tires you may actually end up in mud and you may need that winch you need the communications from the cb and ham radio and i would say that every vehicle vehicle needs probably at least three different power inverters i would say inverter number one is going to be somewhere around 100 watt that you can plug into a cigarette lighter uh inverter number two is going to be about a it's going to probably be about a 700 watt that you can put on the battery terminals and then the third one is going to be probably about a thousand watt but that is not for normal draw okay you can hurt your battery and you can hurt your alternator if you're pulling that much power okay that inverter is for destination destination only all right i would also say have clothing both winter and summer items and a jacket if you're like me You have both winter and summer items and a jacket in your vehicle, but the type of jacket that you have changes based on the seasons. Every season, I go through what's in my vehicle and I change that. And the winter and summer clothing items, those change a little bit too based on whether I'm in winter, in summer, which one am I gearing more toward. All right, so have hiking boots or shoes in your vehicle as well. You need some, you know, you could be in dress shoes. You could be in, uh, you know, your wife. She could be in high heels or something like that. So each person needs to have some hiking boots or shoes, something that they can go for miles in to get back home or to get away. You need to have that kind of stuff in your vehicle as well. And then have blankets and a tent. This is shelter, okay? You need to keep warm. You need to keep dry so have blankets in a tent and then protective items such as pepper spray taser guns and while you're in the vehicle i wouldn't recommend it otherwise but while you're in the vehicle i would recommend having your firearm legally on you okay so that's the things that i think should be in your bug out vehicle real quick but be sure to go back to the show notes and click the link and follow it to the other podcast and I can give you more information than that. So I appreciate the question, Nick. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so the next question is Brett from Georgia. He emailed a question to me, so I'm going to go ahead and read his email. Okay, Brett says, hey, Ken, recently found your podcast and have really enjoyed listening. I love your topic selection and appreciate all your knowledge you're sharing with your listeners. I have a few questions about creative use of my electric golf cart for backup power. I keep it charged all the time for use around the yard and hauling grandkids around the block using the standard PowerWise golf cart charger that came with it. Here are my questions. Can I charge that puppy with a Schumacher XC103W if I need to? Also, can I hook an inverter up to the battery bank in the cart and pull power in an emergency? If so, where do I connect the inverter leads? Thanks for any info you can provide. Again, I really enjoy your podcast and I'm starting to make headway browsing your website as well. Have a good one. Brett from Georgia. 
Well, Brett, the uh, first thing I'm going to tell you is I have an entire suite of information that will teach you almost everything that you need to know about batteries and going off grid and using lead acid and all this other stuff. Okay, I have over six podcasts. That's that's basically six hours of content for you to listen to to get more answers on battery banks. But yours is going to be a long one because I have spent quite a bit of time to make the the answer for this just right for you. So listen up because I've got a very good answer for you, Brett. First thing, golf carts are generally 48 and 36 volts. All right, I've seen more 36 volt golf carts than I have 48 volt golf carts. My assumption is yours is probably going to be a six battery golf cart or a 36 volt golf cart. Okay, my assumption is being drawn by the fact that you said that you have a power wise charger. Okay, so you probably have six GC2 batteries in series. Six times six is going to be 36. Next, the Schumacher XC103W is a good charger, but it only operates at 6 or 12 volts. This means that it's going to be very difficult for you if you don't know all the electrical stuff that you need to know about it. You, It's going to be very difficult for you to charge from this charger. but it So it's going to be difficult, but it is not impossible for you to hook up. Okay, But if you don't know what you're doing, you can create a fireball. I would stay away from this idea, but let me just step back and explain to you kind of some ideas of what you could do. If you were trying to put these batteries where that they are together in a bank of 12 volts, which once again, I don't really recommend you doing this. I would recommend you getting extra power wise chargers. Okay, let me stay on that for a minute. These power wise chargers, I saw many YouTube videos of people that were ripping them apart and repairing them, which sounds to me like this is a very good charger for you to be able to repair by watching some YouTube videos. Once you know how to repair this thing, you can probably get all all the parts and pieces you need, or you can get old golf carts that have good chargers, and you can keep those chargers put up on a shelf somewhere in case you have problems with your current power. PowerWise charger. That's what I would recommend for you. But if you wanted to use a 12 volt charger or a 6 volt charger, you would have to run a ton of cable. You would have to run a bunch of cable to two switches. And each of these switches is probably going to have to have somewhere around 10 contacts. And the the switch that you turn will have to not only break every connection in the circuit that is currently there, it's going to have to make new connections so So your old battery lineup looks absolutely nothing like your new battery lineup or vice versa. So you see what I'm saying? I don't think it's a wise idea for you to charge. Another way that you would be able to do it is unhook the batteries. Okay, completely unhook the batteries from your uh, from your golf cart, and then you could charge them two at a time with your Schumacher charger. Um, You would just charge across two of the batteries at a time. You could technically do this while the batteries are connected to your, um, while the batteries are connected, but I would recommend just disconnecting it if you're going to do that. If you're going to charge while it's connected, then you're going to have to pony up a little bit more money and you're going to have to buy some solar chargers or, or something like that that, and you're going to have to use those. Okay. But like I said, You'll, if you don't know what you're doing, you will create a fireball here, so don't do it. Now, you can hook up an inverter to it. Of course you can. All right, the inverter is a much easier answer than charging it because it's less likely that you're going to damage something if you have a bunch of inverters hooked up to this battery bank than if you have a bunch of chargers hooked up. The main difference here is that your battery bank, when you're charging, is a load and you're introducing multiple sources to charge this battery bank. That makes it difficult. That makes explosions much more likely, okay? But if you are hooking up inverters to your battery bank, now you have a single source and multiple loads. 
it is very easy to connect multiple loads in a circuit. Yes, it is possible to connect multiple sources in a circuit. That's what the 36 volt battery bank is, but you have to know what you're doing more there than you have to with the loading. However, you can still cause fireballs if you do this incorrectly, all right? You can have many separate inverters on the battery bank with possibly over 700 amp hours of capacity, okay? Amp hours, one amp hour is one amp for one hour, okay? So 700 amp hours means that that's 700 amps over one hour or one amp over 700 hours, okay? So this, if you listen to the other episodes, I explain further about that, why that's not 100% the case, but it is close enough for the explanation here. So 700 amp hours, 700 amps over one hour, or 700 hours at one amp. This can be over 800 hours. Sorry, let me change that. I messed that up. This can be over 8,000 hours of light with a two watt LED bulb. And that is seven hours of light or seven hours of running a basic coffee pot. Okay. And coffee pots are pulling a whopping 10 amps. That's one of the biggest loads in your house is a coffee pot. But that's seven hours of running a coffee pot. Not only that, but based on the phone, the type of battery and the type of charging it uses, that is over 4,000 to 8,000 cell phone charges. Okay. That is a lot of cell phone charges. Your cell phone is going to give before you charge it that many times. I'm going to tell you that right now. This is all without a single charge on your battery bank. You can get this much out of that bank without one single charge. Assuming that these are new batteries and and they're they're fully charged and everything else. Let's discuss how we're going to do this. Okay, there are other ways, but this is the most simple way that you're going to do this. We are going to break the batteries or break it, the six batteries, into three pairs of batteries. Each pair of battery can have an inverter. So each pair can power one inverter. That means that you'll be able to power three inverters at one time. You can actually parallel inverters and stuff like this and create more functionality here. Let's keep this simple. Let's use the KISS method. I'm going to tell you, you have three pairs of batteries. That means you have six batteries broken up into three pairs. Each pair can power one inverter. You will place the negative cable of your inverter on the negative terminal of battery number one, your first battery. And then the positive terminal of the first battery will be wired to the negative terminal of the second battery. The positive wire of the inverter will be wired to the positive terminal of the second battery. And you can do every bit of this. The benefit of this is your golf cart wiring. All the wiring in the golf cart can remain complete. You don't have to unhook anything to run your inverters, okay? Your inverters can be still hooked up the entire time. As a matter of fact, you can have inverters hooked up to your golf cart, at least one inverter hooked up to your golf cart at all times, even when you're running it. I wouldn't recommend this, but I am telling you that you can do it. It is 100% possible. I have a diagram on today's show notes. That's the prepperpodcast.com forward slash 053. I have diagram, uh, a diagram on the show notes that show you exactly what I am talking about. The inverter, if you choose to have an inverter there 100% of the time while you're operating the golf cart and everything else, you will probably hook the inverter up on the exact same terminals as the 12 volt lights that are on the golf cart. You can look at my diagram and it will show you what I'm talking about. Okay, I have one big word of caution. These inverters, according to the golf cart, are not grounded. So neither the cables that go from the terminals to the inverter nor the extension cord that you're going to plug into the inverter can touch metal on the golf cart. As long as you have rubber on the cable, as long as the, um, as long as the shielding is around the wires, you're okay. But if it cuts through and it touches the golf cart, it's going to be bad. 
So don't do that. You have to be careful. To, and I would try to keep the leads off of metal parts of the golf cart because chances are something eventually will get cut. And when that happens, you're going to ground it out. And when you ground it out, it could be bad. You'll get how much power? You'll get all of it, every bit of it, the full thing. So you can wire up three inverters to this bank. And I would stick with the PowerWise charger. Okay? So that's going to be the end of the questions. I really appreciate you guys' questions. I actually have more questions that I'm going to go over next week. This is awesome. Three weeks in a row, I'm going to be answering you guys' questions. And next week is going to be a really good one. I'm going to have some more electrical questions. So if you guys like these, remember to get up with me at 978 knows it or 978-566-9748 or go to theprepperpodcast.com and click on the green banner and if you click on the green banner it will enable the microphone on your computer to leave me a message that message will be emailed to me at ken at theprepperpodcast.com it will automatically email me so you don't have to remember that which how many times I say that, I highly doubt that you won't remember it. And with that, this was Ken Jensen of ThePrepperPodcast.com, loving life, loving answering your questions, and teaching you strategies on self-reliance so that you can build a more resilient and more enjoyable life. Have a wonderful week. This is Ken, signing out.